What is going on? Hey, we are here for another grid talk, and I've got Rich Carey on here from Montgomery, Alabama. Rich, oh, is it Montgomery, Alabama? It's Montgomery. It is. Alabama. It's Montgomery. Yep. Yep. I got it. I got it. And I, you know, Rich, you and I connected about a month ago now, mm -hmm. right? And we were exploring and going deep on your uh, on your story. And right. I love understanding the hero's journey, kind of understanding the thinking of why real estate investing, why investing. Yeah. Like when I was talking to you and, and reading about you, I realized that this is something that's been on your mind a long time. Right? Sure, definitely. You've yeah. consumed a lot of content through the years. Mm -hmm. And then why don't you share with us a little bit about your background? Because essentially what you were explaining to me was, you know, you were a special agent for the Air Force, which is like the NCIS, right? That's which, right, the NCIS of the Air Force, except um, no TV show yet. No TV show. Okay. Yeah. Well, kind of walk, how does somebody from, you know, that background decide that they're going to go all in on investing in real estate investing? Yeah. Well, yeah, kind of my background. So I joined the Air Force in uh, 2000 and you know, I joined the Air Force and I was kind of like, well, maybe this will be a 20 year career. If you do 20 years and you, you get a retirement. I'm somebody who grew up, I can't say, I mean, I grew up in a family that just kind of, you know, ran, you know, paycheck ran out every month. And so I was always kind of uh, maybe insecure about money. And I saw my parents being insecure about it. I remember worrying that, you know, what if something happened and I didn't get that military retirement? Like what if they changed the rules or they kicked me out or I just needed to leave for some reason? So I had this idea when I was in the military, like I need to build something else. I need to build enough money on the side to where no matter what happens at the end of a 20 year career, if I don't get a retirement, uh, I'd still be okay, you know, and I'd be able to um, live off that if I needed to, like say a medical problem or just, you know, wh whatever happened. I mean, I was just nervous about it. And I always had this love for real estate. Uh, and there's there's several reasons for that. One was that my grandmother, uh, when she was a single mom, uh, you know, a single mom, like back in the, gosh, probably the forties or something, she, um, she did a house hack. I mean, she bought she bought a fourplex. She lived in one and uh, rented out the rest. This is in Southern California, and that really ended up being her her financial salvation. Mm. And I always kind of admired that. My grandfather on the other side, my dad's side, he was a superintendent. He built you know new construction, and I was just always around real estate. And I just had a love for it, so I kind of knew that was the right direction for me. Mm -hmm. Interesting, and and so you were you were planning for the future essentially. Right. Yeah. You were like, hey, I saw I saw people in my past do this. And so I know it's real. Right. Because I've seen people in my life do it. And I'm hedging my bets in case something happens in the future. Right. Right. Well, where did you I'm just curious. Where did you start? How did the first one occur? Because mm -hmm. right? I find that the first one many times is often the most challenging for people. Yeah, I think, and, and in a way, I had sort of two firsts uh, it, it, from my perspective, because I, I think one was just the first house I ever bought. And then several years later, it was like, okay, now I'm investing in, in kind of a different style of house. And, and it was my first again. But as far as the first house I ever bought, you know, I joined the military in 2000. And then I just sort of had this sense. I always, even when I was a kid, I had this sense of like real estate is always appreciating. So I need to buy now because it's going to be worth more in the future. Mm -hmm. And I had that in 2000. I was like, geez, I need to buy something. But I lived in Guam. And I don't know if, like, I don't know if that many listeners know where Guam is. But uh, a lot don't probably. But you got to look on a map. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's out like way past Hawaii. Um, I lived in Guam and it wasn't the right uh, location to buy a house. Um, in fact, the apartment I lived in uh, was destroyed in a Category 5 uh, hurricane. Hmm. So I'm glad I didn't buy there. But, um, you know, I... I it wasn't until 2003 that I ended up in a location, uh, DC, where I thought I could buy something. And that was, to be specific, because you're from the area, mm -hmm. uh, Alexandria. I was in Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was stationed at Andrews Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, we got to buy. So we bought. And we bought a townhouse for $280,000. The market was hot, multiple offers. I mean, it's, it's exactly like it was now. Mm -hmm. um, and... I thought it was the biggest mistake of my life. I mean, I thought I was horribly overpaying by spending mm -hmm. 280,000 on a townhouse. And what was interesting was about a year and a half later, that house was worth more than 400,000. So I was like, wow, like this, 
this real estate thing is easy. Like I'll just keep doing that. <laughs> and um, hey, well, the truth. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what the interest rate was when you purchased? I think I do. I, I believe that I bought it on a, if you're familiar with an 80, 10, 10 loan, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I bought it for 280,000 and then uh, I put 10% down and then 10% was financed at 7%, mm -hmm. but my rate on the loan was 5.5%. Got it. Yeah. 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 I just want to give everybody a perspective. Right? Yeah. I and I thought it was, I thought it was super low. I mean, it, it was yeah. super low. It was low. Yeah. It was low. Right. Yeah. Okay. So a couple years later, it, it went to 400 and changed, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, because the market was doing this, right? Started kind of like 2000, started gaining a lot of momentum. Yeah. Right, and but I was trying to buy more. I was trying to buy more properties. I'm like, this is easy. I'm just going to go out and keep doing this. But the bidding, right? The bidding got worse and the prices just skyrocketed. And I got this sense like, gosh, I don't know. Like I, now I'm really nervous and I ended up not not buying. I actually did um, buy new construction. And I think I told you about this, but I bought new construction, but I did it as a flip. Like I was hoping that I'd buy it. And then a year later when it was built, I'd just take my hundred thousand of, you know, appreciation and leave. And that didn't happen. There was no appreciation because this is actually at the top of the market. I was able to sell that house without losing money, but pretty much everyone that sold after me ended up in trouble. Yeah, you were so let's let's unpack that a little bit because that was the speculation game, right? That was mm -hmm. people were speculating the yeah. new construction was going to be worth a hundred thousand dollars more once it was finished, and that's what it occurred for a couple of years. So people got away with it for a little bit. I did yep. and, and, until until it didn't work anymore, right? <laughs> and but you were fast to react. What I saw a lot of people do was not come to terms with that reality super fast, and they just kept they just kept chasing the market down right yeah so, yeah like how did you how did you did you did you freak out and you're like right, that's it i'm out i I'm think i i think i easily scare and i'm i'm a i mean i'm a very conservative investor and i easily scare mm -hmm. didn't buy houses when they were on the way up and i think that was ended up being a smart move um i was i was my heart was set on making a hundred thousand dollars and mm -hmm. i saw other people do it you know two or three times and i was like well this is easy i'll just do it and when that didn't happen I actually made 10,000 and I was actually upset. I mean, I was upset about it because you, you've got this anchoring in your mind of like what it should be. And so I kind of thought, well, if it used to be 10,000, hundred thousand, now it's 10,000. Like, I don't like that trend. I'm just stopping. And so I did, I just stopped and I actually Wait, moved to monitor. What yeah. year was that? I think it might've been late 2006. Got it. Okay. And right then I fell off a cliff. Right. I yeah. moved to Monterey, California. Now, of course, I'm talking to real estate agents and everybody's, you know, oh my God, this is the best market ever. You're going to make a fortune. I almost bought a house in Monterey for $900,000. It was a two bedroom, one bath. You had a view of the ocean. And, um, you know, I mean, they, of course, the real estate agents are like, oh, you're going to make a fortune. You got to buy this thing. Well, I chickened out. I was nervous. I didn't like what happened with my last, you know, transaction. It was actually in Dumfries, you know, and oh, yeah. you know where Dumfries is. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just like, ah, you know what? I'm going to rent. And what I ended up doing was I'm in the, I was in the military, right? So I rented for 1300 a month, but I made 2300 a month. So me and my wife just pocketed that $1,000. Mm -hmm. And we were there for three years and the market crashed while we were there. And lots of people that bought either there or in neighboring communities lost 30 to 50% of their value. Mm -hmm. That, um, that that just to be clear, that that extra thousand was the stipend, right? You were given a certain yeah, amount. Yeah, that's exactly. In the military, your paycheck's kind of weird. You get like a base pay, and then you get a locality pay, and mm -hmm. then it's pretty high in places like DC, Honolulu, yeah, and San Francisco, and, and of course Monterey, California. So it was twenty three hundred for you know for the rank that I was at the time. I'm sure it's a lot higher now, but I was able to rent a nice uh, two bedroom, one bath for for thirteen hundred. So that's what mm -hmm. I did. Got it. And I saved up money. I saved up money so that I'd be ready for whatever came next in real estate. And were you anticipating that? I mean, so what came next was obviously the market 2008 started sliding downwards. 2008 yeah. felt like a full implosion. Lehman Brothers goes bankrupt, right? When did you decide to get back in? I believe, let's see, I was in Japan and it's right about when, you know, things crashed and they'd crashed probably in 2009. Yeah. Um, I was in Japan and every time I came back to DC a lot, I was in the military. I came back a lot to, you know, to, because it was our headquarters was there, 
So I would meet with people. And every time I came back, I would look at real estate with uh, a neighbor friend of mine who was um, a real estate agent and an investor and, you know, it was a contractor. Mm -hmm. And I kept looking at houses with him and I just thought like, maybe I can make something work. And he's like, hey, Rich, I've been flipping houses in this neighborhood. And it was the same neighborhood where I owned, Mm -hmm. where I I owned from 2003. He says, I've been flipping in this neighborhood. If you want to go in as a partner with me, you finance the property. I'll do the flip. We'll just split the profits. Mm-hmm. Now the, the idea kind of scared the crap out of me because I was in. I mean, I was in. Well, you can start with it. Yeah, I, I was in. Um, you know, I was in Japan and like I, I, I liked him, but like I didn't know him like super well. Well, I did it. I mean, I did. I did one property with him, and I think we made uh, maybe thirty something thousand on it, and we split that. Uh, on uh, no, actually. We made thirty thousand on. I made thirty thousand on that, and he made thirty thousand. Got it. Uh, and then we we did that eight times. We did that eight times over the next uh, couple of years, and mostly it went well. I think I lost money twice, and once was just a little money. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was just sort of this period of like hitting a bottom and things coming back up. We just mm-hmm. sort of flipped houses during that period, mm-hmm. and uh, I didn't like it. I didn't like it because. I, it just seemed like gambling to me. Like I, I wasn't really controlling the process. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't picking properties. I wasn't managing projects. I was just basically saying, yeah, I'll flip a house with you. So I, I took the money and I was happy about it. And I'm like, well, but I don't want to start losing money. And so I basically stopped and said, okay, I'm going to figure something else out. But like, you know, thanks for this opportunity. It was great. But he, he was, le- he was leveling up. Like, let's do it at $800,000. Let's do it at a yeah. million dollars. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'm out. Like, it's just, it's getting too, uh, it's getting too real for me. Mm-hmm. And so, so what I'm hearing so far is you, you started, you got your feet wet a little bit, you did some investments, you did the speculation, you got out clean on that speculation. You went in, yeah. you're now creating more earned income as a flipper partner, right? right. Yeah. But, but what you're known for is building cash flow, right? Yeah. Like yeah. at some point you said, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to build cash flow in my life. Like, where did that, when did that switch occur? How did it occur? And then kind of share with us what what your world looks like now. Well, and I've talked about, I talked about earlier how I'm conservative and something that I did that I think is unusual for most real estate investors. In 2003, I bought the house in, in, uh, you know, in Alexandria. Well, I, I was kind of like in a hurry to pay it off. We paid it off in seven years. So we paid off that mortgage of 224000 I think, in seven years. Mm-hmm. So now it's cash flowing better, right? I'm mm-hmm. seeing more cash flow. Uh, and, and by the way, I, you know, at the can time I, I was- you, Rich, I, yeah. I mean, obviously you made additional payments on that. Like, can, give me yeah. the strategy on that. Like, were you guys saying, hey, what was the strategy? Any additional cash? Like, were you like, you know- Yeah, I think maybe, you know, certainly we were paying double payments. And then I think it was just sort of, I would call it the windfall into your mortgage strategy. Like, um, if uh, we came into some extra income, like, I don't know, you know, uh, income tax returns. Well, that that goes into the house. Mm. Uh, somehow made extra money. Um, yeah, we the $30,000 flip. Yeah, you know, we, you, we would you, take like money and we were putting it in index funds and just like we had like normal brokerage accounts. We had like IRA and we had the military version of the 401k. We were feeding those, but we were also feeding extra money to the mortgage. And we didn't necessarily have like a formula for it, but we were just doing both. And uh, let's see. So some of the flips went into this too. The flip money went into paying off the property yeah. uh, as well. So that's kind of how we did it. But so I, that just kind of gives you my, my mindset. Now, jumping forward to 2013, and to answer your question, um, we moved to Montgomery, Alabama. And I was upset about moving there. And I was certainly thinking like, well, I'm not going to do any real estate while I'm in Montgomery, Alabama, because this place is, you know, ugh, I don't, I don't like it. That was the kind of feeling I had. Um, but on, on the first day of class, and I was attending an air war college, and um, we were introducing ourselves to each other. It was like the first day of class. And there was a guy in class. And he was first introducing himself. And he's, he, like I had just moved there, but he had been there for two years already doing a different assignment. And now he was attending our work college. And he's like, hey, I've been here for a couple of years and my name's so-and-so and I do this, I'm a pilot. And he's like, and, and while I've been here in Montgomery, Alabama, like I've been buying houses and I'm like making tons of money and this is great. And I'll, you know, at this rate I could like retire next year. And then like nobody really even listened to what he said. And I was like, oh my God, like, 
what did that guy just say? <laughs> and, and I was just like, wow. Like, I it just, I mean, that hit me because I've been, yeah. I was thinking like, well, wait a second. I have one property and I'm not, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't make that much money. Like, what's he talking about? So I didn't hear a word that anybody said for the next hour. And then when we went to the break, I just like, you know, jumped over the table and like make, made a beeline for him. And I just peppered him with questions like, okay, what's going on with this real estate? Like, how much do you buy it for? What does it rent out for? Um, you know, what, what about contractors? Okay, what about property manager when you move away? And he had answers for everything. And then finally, I was just like, will you show me how to do this? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. So, so he did. I mean, he, he introduced me to a real estate agent. He introduced me to a property management company. He gave me a few contractors' phone numbers, and I bought a property. And, and that's how I got started. I love that. There's so much wisdom there, right? It's like your mind was ready to take in that information. Everybody else was like, eh, right? right. They, they, their mind had not been primed yet. Your mind had been mm -hmm. primed. And, and then, you know, here's somebody that's just willing to share. Like I always tell everybody, people are willing to share. If you just ask yeah. them, how right. did you do it? Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so you bought one. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you digested that. How long, how long before you bought the second one? Were you just like <laughs> off to the races or? So what happened? Have, yeah. So the first property was, um, it was a challenge for me and like a lot of bad things happened. You know, when I, I bought the property now, first of all, I'm just not that handy. And I, I just didn't understand and didn't understand like construction that well, didn't understand working with contractors, didn't know, didn't know what problems I could end up having with a house. Like I just didn't know. So, um, I bought this house for $30,000. It's probably going to run out for seven fifty dollars a month. So we all know that that sounds pretty good. And this isn't in, and this isn't in a horrible neighborhood. This is just a, I would just call it a blue collar neighborhood here. Mm -hmm. And um, so I bought it and put some money into it. I probably put in $15,000. Uh, probably eight or 9000 of that was unnecessary because I just didn't know what I was doing. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I put like a, you know, governor's mansion shine on the hardwood floors when that probably wasn't necessary in a rental property. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I bought the house and I got an inspection on it, I guess my inspector didn't do a good job. After I closed, I went to the, I went to one of the rooms in the house and removed some trash from the middle of the room only to find that the, the floor was pushed up about three feet in that spot. <laughs> it was like pushed up into the air, like in the middle of the room. And they had laid like a Christmas tree on it or something like, and, and nobody noticed it. Right. And so I spent the next couple of uh, weeks talking to contractors about what, what do you think this is and how am I going to get this fixed and how much is it going to cost? And I, I had prices anywhere from, you know, 5,000 to 40,000, right, to fix this problem. Well, somebody came along and fixed it for $1,000 and it was a root that was growing up through the floor and it wasn't the end of the world, but it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> when people moved in, when the property got moved into, and it was vacant for three months, that was kind of a problem. When it got moved into uh, and, the, and the tenants turned, turned on like the, I don't know, sink or something, the water wasn't running. So I got a phone call sent to, you know, water's not running. And it's actually, there's, but there's water running into the front yard. Turns out there's a crawl space and somebody went in and stole all the copper out from under the bottom of my house. So I'm just like, geez, okay, so whatever. I'm into this for like 45,000 now. And I started at, you know, started at 30,000. Uh, okay. It's, I mean, it's going to rent for 750. So I'm, it's certainly not a bad deal. Certainly not, not these days, but, um, I was, I was exhausted and I was just mentally like, Oh my God, this is killing me. And my wife is like, well, I mean, we try, but like, you know, this real estate thing is just clearly not for us. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. I said, I want to, I want to try again. I want to keep going. <laughs> and she's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, like let's, let's, so, I mean, I kept making offers. I kept yeah. making offers and I believe House number two was probably just a month later. And then I had made tons and tons of offers and what a short sell offer and house number three, or I guess house number three and four were at the same time, mm -hmm. maybe a month and a half after that. Uh, I bought six houses and I bought them all in cash, by the way. I bought six houses um, in the 10 months that I was there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so you bought these six houses, you said, all in cash. Yeah. And, and again, you're being conservative, right? You're like, listen, nobody's going to give me a loan probably for this 30, 40, because you're buying them at 40, 30, 40, $50,000, right? That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so you're like, why, why, why get a mortgage on it? I'm just going to, right. Just get a cash flow. On I, think, I think it was about, first of all, I, I had a frame of reference 
from doing flips in DC, where in DC, I had to come up with down payments to finance these flips. And so those down payments were usually between 60 and $80,000. And I would pay that money. Like I would just, I had it in my checking account or my savings account. And when it came time to buy these houses in Montgomery, Alabama, and it's like, wait, the whole house is $30,000, which is like less than half the down payment. I was, mm -hmm. I was like, why, why would I finance that? Like that's, mm -hmm. there's no reason to. Another thing that I did to free up cash was I had a paid off property in, in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, that wasn't cash flowing very well. I mean, a lot of times houses in high cost of living areas just don't cash flow that well. That's just mm -hmm. a reality. Um, I sold that because I realized I was going to make so much more money in cash flow. Now, certainly not appreciation, but so much more money in cash flow if I could move <laughs> that money into properties, even in cash, into mm -hmm. properties in Montgomery, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And today you self manage those properties. Right. Yeah. Well, the whole time I was in the military and, and of course there's a whole story here, but I used a property management company and they were, they were actually key to me, uh, being able to do this once I left Montgomery, Alabama, because I used the property management company while I was in, uh, while I was in Germany and Japan mm -hmm. for the next five years to continue buying houses. But not just that, they helped me manage the renovations because I almost always bought, you know, value add dilapidated, you know, termites, you know, small fire. I do things like that to get good deals. And of course, as the years went on, you had, you had to find, you know, when I was there in 2013, you could just buy something off the MLS that, that cash flowed well sure. as the years went on. And, and as people kind of got wise to what was going on in Montgomery, Alabama, well, then you had to search for that deal. You know, then you had, then it was more like foreclosure, short sale, mm -hmm. termite problems, fire, stuff like that. But, but I, I did that with my property management company, which I trusted and knew well and already had experience with. What is what is the real estate market look like today in Montgomery, Alabama? Those same houses, what are they selling for? I think, okay, so uh, I think right now you want to buy the same house that I was buying, you know, if, the, you know, $45,000 for a good three bedroom, two bath is going to be about 75 or 80,000 right now. Got it. Uh, Got to it. me, that doesn't seem that much higher, but I guess if you look at it as a percentage, it's, it's a quite percentage. a bit higher. I mean, like that's like saying, you know, 1 million to 1.8, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when you're dealing with small numbers, it just doesn't seem like that big of a climb, but uh, yeah. Well, what's interesting is Montgomery, Alabama growing or shrinking? I would say it's shrinking. Yeah. Um, and, and again, this is just my philosophy on real estate. I know that a lot of people, right? A lot of people love these these lists that, you know, these people put out about like, oh my gosh, it's the top 20 cities for rental properties, top 20 cities for growth. Like this is where, you know, this is where all the action is. Everybody's doing Austin. Everybody's going to Denver. Uh, that's never interested me because usually by the time, in my mind, by the time that information's out there, you you've already missed the boat. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're not, gonna, first of all, you're never going to find the, the cash flow opportunities that, that I have here. I believe that the key mm -hmm. to, to success in real estate has a lot more to do with you could probably do it anywhere as long as you're an expert in your market, as long as you really understand the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And certainly now that I'm back here in person again, I would also say um, having connections, knowing people, you know, knowing the other investors, knowing the property owners, and really understanding the you know, street by street differences and crime issues and what's planned with the city and all that stuff. So that's kind of what I focus on. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I have a portfolio of, of properties that that sound kind of similar. They're in a in a little town. The town is two hours away from where I live, mm -hmm. but but we have not experienced the, any appreciation there. Like, no, no. and maybe this year there might be, but it's really always kind of been a. What I find is that the the the, the investors that win in that game do owner financing, right? It's an owner like they buy them cash and then they owner finance those assets. And they kind of become like a sub sub subprime lender, right? To to the local exactly, community, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to work well because the tenant pool there just kind of just does this churning, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, within Montgomery, Alabama, is there a segment that you really try to focus on? Meaning, you know, I'm sure you have war zones in Montgomery, Alabama, and you've got other areas that are kind of blue collar and other yeah, more more fluent, like yeah. Mentally, do you have advice around that? I do. So I think that when you know, certainly like, you know, usually the, uh, 
you know, I have like a, a blog and a lot of the stuff that's on my blog is targeted towards military members that want to do real estate or people that move all the time, maybe like federal employees or something. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of them will assume that I'm here in Montgomery, Alabama, because I'm just renting out to other military members. And the truth is, I don't think I've ever rented to a military member. Mm -hmm. um, and what I tell people that, you know, want to invest is sometimes it makes more sense to rent the house that you want to live in and then um, buy houses in areas that make sense for rental properties. And that's certainly the case here. I found that in my life, and certainly in this city, if you wanna be in a gated community <laughs> that has a golf course and it has tennis courts and it's got like gates or something, certainly a military member could, could buy a house there and live there and then rent it out when he leaves. He's not gonna make very much money. Like the price to rent ratio just isn't gonna work. And lots of people in the military do this. And they don't really understand that they don't really have a great a great asset there. Now, I think that's the case with my house in, in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, kind of the same thing, just never really cash flowed well, probably much less than 6%, probably more like three or 4% you know, ROI uh, with a mortgage. So um, I think, you know, I, I, I rented in the, in the neighborhood where my, you know, family felt comfortable and the schools were better, but I bought in a, in more of a blue collar, like the crime isn't bad, um, but the schools aren't great. And I mean, people, take care of the yards and you know, there isn't like serious problems at night, but there's like petty theft at night. And mm -hmm. um, it's just, I, I would almost call it a middle ground. Like it's, mm -hmm. these aren't properties where, where you have like drug problems in the houses only cost 15 or 20,000 mm -hmm. and you have like raids and murders and stuff. But these also aren't good school districts mm -hmm. and aren't like, you know, prettier houses with, you know, big yards and, and uh, people having like, you know, I don't know, boats and, and different things in the, in the driveway. It's just a blue collar working you know, neighborhood. Yeah, and yeah. that yeah. sweet spot has the best, I think, price to rent ratio and uh, tenant and bang, for your, bang for your buck with risk, I think. Because mm -hmm. I feel like risk is still low. Risk is still low. Yeah. Now it's still like always fresh paint and always like, you know, clean carpet, nice floors. Everything's nice in these houses when somebody moves in. But, you know, it's not like, it's not like, expensive chrome appliances and you know granite marble countertops there's just just not necessary sure and man i love your blog rich on money we're going to put it on the show yeah. notes right? oh, I, thanks. I, yeah. love, like, I was like i just got it rich yeah. on money right and so yeah on your blog i think you're you're really helping people build it almost seems like you have a calling on helping people build financial freedom right yeah um, it is yep. cash flow right mm -hmm. so yeah. So what are some of the, like, let's say if you were just, and it's geared mainly towards military people, right? I it think that that's, yeah. that that's really, I think my dad could have really, my dad was foreign service. I don't know if I yeah. told you that. My dad was. Yeah, yeah you did. Yeah. And I, I kind of worked a lot with, yeah, State Department enjoyed it. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that they, like, man, this would have been perfect for them back in the day. Right. Um, but, you know, what what are some of the, the key pieces of advice that you would give? I'll, I'll tell you what I've heard mm -hmm. so far, mm -hmm. right? I've heard. Hey, I lived below my means. I took ex excessive cash, excess cash that we had, and we 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 paid off debts, right? We lived, we wanted to be conservative. It wasn't about keeping up with the Joneses. It was about building a solid fat base. Yeah. One that can never be taken away from me. Right. And security is one of the things that probably is a high value for you. It right? is, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and you know, everybody's wired a little bit different. I share that in common with you. I'm like, hey. You know, I want to have a base that nobody could ever knock off, right? And I think a lot of people yearn for that, but they don't have the self-discipline for it or that mm -hmm. nobody speaks that truth into them, right? But what are two or three pieces of advice that you would give people? You know, they go to your blog, like they, they might discover there. Well, the first thing I'd say is, um, you know, the way that I this all unfolded isn't necessarily like the ideal way to do it. It's just like, it's like my story, you know, it's my story. And it ended up being successful, but I can pinpoint times in the past where I can pinpoint now, like, well, gosh, I probably shouldn't have done that, or I do this different. And one of those things for me is paying off the uh, property, right? Paying off the first mortgage. I think, I mean, I, with sort of the understanding that I have of finance and real estate now, it would have been a lot smarter to just keep that cheap money and do other things with the extra money that I had. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the smartest way to invest in real estate is 20% down, 20% down, 
buy a property, 30 years fixed. I won't play with any other thing. I won't do arms or, or 15 year or anything like that. And make sure that that property is cash flowing. And hopefully you're seeing some appreciation. Hopefully like, you know, you don't have bad luck with that house with tenants or something. Mm -hmm. And when that's gone well, then I'd say, okay, now you get yourself another 20% and do it again. And that is probably the advice that I would give to a majority of people. Mm -hmm. Just to like play it safe, do it right, have some equity. You can survive a downswing. Prove to yourself that this one's working before you move on to the next one. Yeah. Uh, that that's kind of how, how I feel. Another thing that's important to me is um, I think that I think that starting from a financial financial position of strength is very important. So I feel like IRAs and 401ks, especially like if you have matching, like those things are really important. And a lot of people, especially when they fall in love with real estate or they go to certain you know popular blogs or websites and get on forums, it's like, man, screw your retirement accounts. Like, take that money and just throw it into real estate. You're going to make so much money and you can do syndications and seller financing and no money down. And that's just not me. I say, max your IRA, max your 401k, then start figuring out how to save up money for a down payment. A lot of people are going to say, well, I don't have enough money to do that. I guess my answer is then figure out how to figure out how to get enough money to do that because I think that's the smartest way to do it. I like having a nice, you know, nice, healthy retirement account that's going to be there no matter what ha what happens with my real estate. Mm -hmm. Certainly I would not forego or even raid my retirement accounts to invest in real estate. And so that's probably like the core of my philosophy as an investor. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like there's diversification there, right? Yep. Yeah. There's diversification there. Um, you said something that I, I think, you know, it's interesting. You, you're right. It's like what works for you. And it's also, I would, I would add, it's a proven strategy. We know that that strategy just works mm -hmm. and that you're minimizing your downside, right? Yeah. There, there, yeah. Are, there are the personalities that I've met. There's like the developer personality that's willing to risk it all, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and they're fine if it completely implodes. Um, but man, it's painful when it does for them. And I've seen right. it implode for many of them. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I'm typically helping them get out of that or bail out of that. And, right. Yeah. Um, and, it, and then they kind of recalibrate and they're like, okay, listen, I need a little bit more balance in my life. But for many years, there's been, I mean, let's look, let's, let's look at this from 2009 to today. It's been an awesome real estate market. Yeah. Okay. It's That's been right. an awesome. So, so there's a whole segment that has never got its ass kicked. Right. Yet. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, there's no inventory in the market. Like, I can't see anything fundamentally that would really slow this down unless you're seeing something that I'm not seeing, right? So there's there's no inventory. No. We need more inventory. Even if more foreclosures do come because of, of everything, we need it. The market needs it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lag in construction. There's a migration, different migration patterns occurring right now. People leaving California, moving to states like Tennessee, maybe Alabama or Florida, yeah, that's true. right? Yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, you're going to see, I think, maybe micro pockets that suffer. You might have areas in San Francisco that go, you know, I, but, but in on the balance, it's not like before. Before I was like, hey, this feels like a rational exuberance and, there's all these adjustable arms and what happens if those things, you know, adjust. Yeah. And I remember thinking that without really understanding all that much about it. Yeah. It, like it doesn't feel, and, and by the way, actually what didn't feel right was this, the no income, no doc loans, right? No income, no doc. I know. Yeah. I know. No income verification, no doc. And I was like, today it still takes, you know, it takes blood work. To, to get a loan, right? It's, it does, yeah. Yep. And so that like that was right. And you know, the other thing that was weird was when I had people that I knew make less money than I made. Not that I was comparison, but it was just like people I knew they made less money than I, but the houses that were buying, they were buying for their personal residence were twice as much as the house that I lived in. Right. And I was yeah. like, it's either a, I'm doing something wrong or they're doing right. It was like yeah. so. What do you see, I guess, is the question. Yeah. Um, I think I think that it's smart to not predict. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't like to. Um, I want to be ready for anything. Uh, I think that 
I bought a bunch of real estate right when COVID started. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this though, I can tell you that that was not my advice for anybody else. Certainly that was not my advice for a beginner. Um, if you're just like getting started in life and like ready to make your first dip into the market, I did not think that March of uh, last year was a good time to start. It just wasn't. Some people thought like maybe it's an opportunity, but there wasn't even really an opportunity yet because nothing really dipped in the market. All we knew is that there was uncertainty that people would pay rent. And so it was just not a good time to start. Mm -hmm. But I had no debt to my name. I knew how cheap money was. You know, I'm about to retire from the military and know that I'm going to have a military retirement. And I'm like, I just need to lock down some cheap money. So I, uh, you know, bought a VA loan personal residence, bought a fourplex and I bought a sixplex and I did those with loans and finally, finally put some money, right? I put some money, uh, you know, uh, into loans, mm. finally, finally borrowed money. So I guess my point is it kind of depends where you are, mm. whether or not you should move forward in this market. And mm -hmm. it is, I, I think it's a risky time. Mm -hmm. to go out and when money's tight and when you're nervous and when you don't really have savings and you're not even really putting money away for retirement yet, be like, oh my gosh, I got to go to go get a, you know, 20 plex because everybody else I know is getting a 20 plex or I, I got to, you know, figure out some way to buy some absurd thing with no money down. I don't like that right now. Uh, certainly with this whole bidding thing, and I'm seeing it in so many cities, I, it's not so crazy here, but I mean, I, I know Atlanta, people that are here are also doing a lot of stuff in Atlanta, you know, like 10, 20, 30, 40. There are sometimes 50 offers on one house. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to overpay. You're going to overpay for a primary residence and you're going to overpay for an investment property. Mm -hmm. Unless you have some way of not dealing with that mess, I really don't recommend making a move right now. That's mm -hmm. my two cents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or finding something off market where there's not a lot of com competition, yep. right? Um, yeah, keeping some dr dry powder on hand in case opportunity does come up, right? Right. Yeah, I like off market deals, right? Finding a way to get off market deals. If you want to buy something, uh, you know, drive for dollars. You know, uh, contact property owners, send out letters. Um, I guess I would call it kind of act like a wholesaler. I mean, go out and find sure. your deal. Don't go to the MLS and play this game that everybody else is playing. Uh, you know, the real estate agents and lenders are just having a field day right now uh, yeah. at, at our expense. For sure. Um, what does your portfolio look like today? How many properties you have? How many are paid off? So I have, that tw I have that 20, 20 that I've just had for a while, 20 single family homes here that were paid off. And the way that I did it, uh, actually, two of them are in my IRA and two of them are in my wife's IRA. So mm -hmm. like, whatever, it's, it's 20 altogether. Sure. Um, and then I bought a sixplex, at, you know, in March of, of last year, and then a fourplex in around June of last year. Uh, the sixplex was my first and only commercial loan. And then the fourplex was just like, you know, an investor residential loan. I actually got a good rate on it. I think it's 4%, which is great for an investor loan. Mm -hmm. Both cases were, uh, well, actually I had 15% down on, on the uh, commercial property, which is pretty good. And 25% uh, down on the, on the fourplex. And that's what I got. So it's 10, 10, uh, I guess you'd say multifamily units. Mm -hmm. So I've got 30 units right now. You, you asked this question earlier, right now I am self-managing, but I've only been doing that for about a year. Uh, I had a property management company doing that for me for the you know, five or six years that I was in the military and not living in Montgomery, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you've got now your uh, retirement income coming in. You've got yeah. cash flow from these assets. So obviously yeah. you've gotten out of what we would call kind of like the rat race, right? Your cash yeah. flow mm -hmm. is substantially higher than your expenses. It is, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was also, you know, more than what I was making in the military when I when I um, got out. So that that was a goal. Like if you can replace your income, then don't run back to another job. And I didn't want to, and so so I'm not going to. Um, so that that was kind of a goal. And another thing in my case too that's important, and this is something that I always you know teach and and try to push to people. I maxed for I maxed our version of the 401k, which is called a TSP and IRAs throughout my career. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's money that's 
sitting in bank accounts, compounding and growing, uh, you know, since about 1999, mm. that uh, I'm not going to touch yeah. for at least uh, 15 more years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you and you'll you're you're not lending that money out. That's just sitting in like a an S and P Vanguard or some something. That's exactly. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it is. There yeah. you go. Okay, yeah. well, that's that's what I do too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just everybody's trying to beat that, right? And it's like, yeah, majority of people don't beat that, right? So let's get that, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, Warren Warren Buffett, right? Warren Buffett is the guy who he has this plan that when he passes away, he's not going to leave the money in his company, Berkshire Hathaway. He's going to put the money in the S&P 500 index. And that's what he's doing for his, I guess you could say his hairs. So, um, heirs. So yeah. like if he's doing that, I think I'll do that. Yeah. That, and that, I read that by the way, I think that was in, um, Tony Robbins book possibly, mm -hmm. or I, I'm not sure where I read it. Yeah, but it was yeah. the advice. It was the advice that he, he, he was giving his wife and he was like, uh -huh. Hey, we're just going to put it all in the S and P Vanguard 500. And that's, yep. that's it. Right. Yeah. I was like, okay. Why do I need to do anything else? It's easy. Yeah. It's, it's easier than playing the game of, you know, whatever, uh, GameStop and Bitcoin and all that. That's right. That's yeah. right. Well, what's the next thing? Like, let's on the end on this, right? I mean, you're a young guy, right? Yeah. You're, you're, you're essentially financially from a cash flow perspective free, right? And now, you know, what do you do from here, right? Yeah. Is it more or mm -hmm. is it more life? Or is it more experiences or is it, I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out, yeah. right? you know? Well, Rob, I guess, um, I don't know. I guess maybe I should start a podcast, right? Who knows? Yeah, uh, for sure. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Um, it's funny though. That, that stuff comes up a lot. So I'm going to have a blog and like, I'm trying to do stuff on YouTube and it's kind of just educational stuff for military members. I didn't really focus on that stuff. Like I would just kind of play with it while, when I was in the military, but I mean, I had a somewhat busy job having the time to focus on stuff like that, you know, to just focus on, okay, I want to keep doing stuff with real estate, real estate education. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, and I talked about this with you right before we started, I'm considering like trying Airbnb. And I think you were talking mm -hmm. about your experience with that. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, like I'm a real estate guy, you know, and I, 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 I've been doing it for a while and I like talking about it, I like writing about it. Like, I like, you know, going on podcasts, so I kind of wanted, okay, let's do this Airbnb thing, have this experience, kind of record the numbers and, and, and be able to share that lesson learned with people. And, uh, you know, if it goes well enough, maybe I double down or triple down on it, you know, and make some money for a while. Um, having the time to do these things you know, is something that I'm very, very happy about. Mm -hmm. uh, because I have, you know, from when I wake up in the morning until I go to bed at night to, to play with stuff like this. Mm -hmm. I take my kids to school a lot more. I drive my kids to activities more, you know, like, you know, whatever it is, uh, swimming and, and, uh, you know, gymnastics. I go to meets more than I used to. Um, and that, this is all good kids? stuff. How, how old are your kids? Uh, 10 and 14. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yep. Good, good time. Like this is such a great, such a, you know, there's so many people I meet that, uh, well, you know, I think of myself when I was younger, um, my daughter's 18 now, she'll be 19, yeah. but I was in the grind. Right. And part of it is I love that grind. Like I mm -hmm. just, I have to self admit, like I loved like what I was doing. And, but if you're not careful, time goes by really fast. Like my daughter turned 18. I was like, Whoa, where did time go? Right. Yeah. And, and one of the things we're doing this summer, I'll just share with you real fast is we're going to take off the, the month of August and we're going to go on an RV. And I, you know, the way we've, kind of talked her in the coming was she's we're bringing the boyfriend along right and and we're they're really she's in the roller skating and he's in the skateboarding and so we're going to go to national parks and skate parks right oh nice and we're yeah, just yeah. Gonna kind of document that and obviously i have the ability to still run our business in a virtual environment which is kind of cool right but i'll right. Yeah. You know, do it two or three hours a day and and uh or not right we'll see like the the you know we're going to see what the, we're going to stress test the business a little bit. Right. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I think that'll be fun to document that too. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, what I hear you saying is passing your knowledge forward, which I think is super important mm -hmm. because there's a young rich out there wanting to figure out how do I do this? How do I get here? Just like that guy yeah. showed you. Right. And I, I almost feel compelled that it's our responsibility to help people on that journey. Right. Yeah. No, um, definitely. Especially for those people that yearn, 
Like I yearned to discover that journey. Like I read everything, right? I attended investment groups. I read every book. I, I was like, this was my thing, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and I'm still on that journey. I enjoy that journey, right? Right. So yeah. And, and I'm I'm curious, Rich. We'll end with this. Do you know what your exit strategy is for your portfolio in the future? Have you thought about that? I, I don't. Um, you know, it's funny. I had a I had somebody make an offer recently, mm. and for a while there, I got excited, like, "Oh, cool! Maybe I'll just take this cash and walk away." Um, and then I got to thinking, like, "No, give up the cash flow, and like, what do I do when I've got the money? And like, what are the tax consequences? I'm not ready to put it in something else." The answer is no. Uh, I don't have my exit strategy, and everybody always says, uh, "Make sure you have your exit strategy, and you know, make sure you have it in mind." Um, I see myself just using the cash flow from these houses for many more years. Uh, I could see myself adding a few. Mm -hmm. I could see myself selling a few. Uh, I'm going to play it by ear. I don't have a solid plan. You know, I I met this guy. I still remember his name was Dave Caldwell. The only reason why I remember was that his wife was Charlotte. My wife's father-in-law, well, my father-in-law was Dave and, Mm -hmm. you know, Charlotte but their last name was Caldwell and he worked for the government for like 35 years. And he just accumulated 30 years. He just accumulated all these real estate assets in Arlington, right? Right, right in Arlington, right in Clarendon, Arlington. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he had at the time when I met him and I'm so dumb, I should have stayed connected with him. I didn't. Right. Um, I was young and I don't know. I was just not, not, not mentally there. Right. Right. Yeah. And, um, he uh, he owned like 130 properties all in mm-hmm. that area. And he was definitely a do-it-yourselfer. I met him at one of his apartment buildings. I still remember being in the apartment building. He had doorknobs. He had doors. He had screws. Like the, the, yeah. that apartment was, and that was, he loved. And he had just come from his farm. And he told me that the farm was a tax write-off for everything else that he did. And mm-hmm. what he was, he was at the stage in his life where he was owner financing all of them. Yeah. Right. And he was just right. selling them to, to people like me at like 8% interest at the time. And I was, I think maybe the going rate was like six and a half. Right. Mm, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, and he, there were 8% interest. And, you know, you think about it, it's just he was, was retaining the cash flow and he was actually the real, still the real owner of that asset. Because if I didn't right. pay him, he would come and take that property. And I've always remembered that. And I've always said, that's more than likely what I'll do is I will, you know, either I put them into a trust, right? And they just, it's a family trust and I do what the Rockefellers have done, right? Or I own or finance them out. Yeah. Right? And I've had, I've had tenants contact me, tenants that I like and ask me to do that. And, uh, it, you know, I got to start looking into it because I keep getting asked. So certainly that would be a good exit strategy. And of course, what's attractive about that mm-hmm. to me yeah. is that, you know, you get a down payment from them. But, but at that point, you're not like, you're not fixing the leaky toilet anymore. Right. right? I mean, you're not even really like repairing the roof. Like they're, it's, it's their house. They're supposed to figure all that stuff out. Yeah. I met met this guy in that little town. Everybody else hated their properties. He loved his properties. And, and I was like, you know, well, what's your model look like? And he's like, listen, I'm not a landlord. These people own these houses. I own them in a, you know, there's a contract for deed and something goes wrong. They take care of it, right? And he would buy these properties at the auction. He'd fix them up to about 90% of fully fit. Like, and then he would tell them, you finish the last 10%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Think about the emotional like, connection of people having to go in and do the work. Them, They're not going to want to lose. He's like, in 30 years, I've only taken back one house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought that was deal. fascinating, right? So- you know, in every market, there's a way to make money. And this guy, I think, did an amazing job. Right? Yeah, sounds so. like it. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, Rich, if people want to find you, right, online, we're going to put down show notes and all the rest. But Great. blog is rich on money, right? That's right. Yep. Is there any anywhere else? Are you on Instagram, Facebook? When you go, yeah, when you go to any of my um, blog posts, you know, um, right at the beginning of the blog post is always like an embed of a YouTube video that's usually on the same subject. So like I have the blog post, I have like the YouTube video video equivalent. 
So from richonmoney.com, you can also get to my YouTube channel, which is like, you know, youtube.com slash richonmoney. And those are kind of my two little passion projects at the moment. Dude, well, I'm going to encourage you to push that because I think it's really cool. I see where oh, you're going you. with it. Mm -hmm. I can see it. I'm like, just add fuel to it. Yeah, definitely. Well, Rich, man, thanks for joining Grid Talk today. I appreciate you. Hey, thank you so much. It was awesome to be on the podcast. Thank anyway, you. I appreciate it. You take care. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.